and welcome to Irish America Magazine. Today, I am pleased to welcome James Carroll, National Book Award winner. Uh, he's a best-selling author as well as a longtime Boston Globe columnist. My name is Tom Degnan, and uh, much of James Carroll's writing that we're going to be talking about today explores his Irish upbringing, his years as a Catholic priest, uh, and the many conflicts that followed as America plunged into Vietnam, civil rights, and all that followed after the 1960s. James Carroll's new book is The Truth at the Heart of the Lie, How the Catholic Church Lost Its Soul, and he is here today to talk about it. James, welcome. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm privileged to be with you. Just as I am privileged to be with you, and one of the many reasons we're doing this on Zoom, of course, is because of the COVID problem that we have been going through for over a year. First and foremost, how are you and your family doing through all of that? Thanks for asking. We're well. We're well. My wife and I, senior citizens, have been fully vaccinated. Uh, our children are doing well. I spent much of today uh, sitting with my granddaughter, who's seven, who's going to school at home. My privilege has been to be her informal tutor slash cheerleader and she's been doing great. Actually, the best thing about this year for me has been a close-up experience of this child, her classmates, and her heroic teacher. So I want to take this opportunity to salute all the children who've been uh, kept from physical school and salute their teachers. Wonderful, wonderful heroes. And of course, their parents all having to cope with it. You yourself uh, have children. Are, are any of them school age people, Tom? Uh, yeah, they're all they're all at home, and uh, you know, like like you said, it's uh, it's obviously tempting to focus on the challenges, but it's also important to sort of see the silver linings in all of this, right? It's true. Well, I um, salute you too as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So let let's get into this. Let's get into the the new book. Uh, it's it's got a hard hitting title, and and right off the bat in the introduction you hit us with, with this quote, for many decades, the Catholic Church has been a, kill, a pillar of my identity. Now that pillar is cracked. Uh, you say that right up front in the introduction. Tell me more about that. What does that mean? Uh, well, your uh, readers and uh, viewers won't be surprised, Tom, when I say that I'm talking about the, especially the focused scandal of the priest sex abuse crisis. The fact that a large number of Catholic priests, a minority, but still a large number of Catholic priests have abused children, while almost every one of the bishops protected the predators instead of the victims. And that lays bare something deeply wrong at the heart of Catholic life. And that's what I'm talking about. So I'm, in this book, as a lifelong Catholic, a serious Catholic, privileged to have been a Catholic priest for five years, a lifetime ago. In this book, I'm really asking the question, how does my faith survive the disillusionment that has come with the collapse of the order of the priesthood? Because I think that's what this scandal has laid bare. And in this book, I deal with that question as honestly as I can. I come out of it at the other end, a chastened Catholic, but still a Catholic, but also inviting people to join me in what I'm calling anti-clericalism from within, a strong rejection of basic assumptions of male supremacy, sexual neurosis, and ecclesiastical hierarchical power, all of which are corrupting the church, the church I love. So there's a ton of stuff that we are definitely going to talk about uh, in that answer you just gave that we want to dig a little deeper into. Uh, but first, let's spiral back a little bit. I mean, you have also, in this book and many other ones, you have, you know, rightly connected uh, all of those issues, not just with your own upbringing, uh, but, but in this book and in others, you spiral back to Ireland in the 19th century. Um, because all that stuff, you, you have to kind of give that whole context. It's to me and, and to you, it's almost, uh, it can't be sort of, the full picture can't be seen without it. Tell me about your upbringing a little bit. This is uh, some of it you explored in your 
one of your most famous books, An American Requiem. How would you characterize your upbringing? How important was the Irishness? Uh, tell me, uh, tell us a little bit more about your upbringing, your parents, and all that. Well, I was raised, Tom, as a proud Irish American Catholic. And those three notes of my identity are all equally important. Irish American Catholic. My mom and dad were Southside Chicago people, what was referred to in their time as Mayor Daly's neighborhood, the original Mayor Daly, a very Irish neighborhood, St. Gabriel's Parish in Chicago. Folks, I think, still identify their origins by the parish they come from. Uh, and that's the world into which I was born and, and raised, even though my folks during World War II moved to Washington, D.C. Still, even there, the Catholic parish we were part of was dominated by the Irish experience, Irish memory. And when I say Irish memory, of course, um, I'm... I'm always quite aware of the way in which the past is present to us Irish. It's true of all kinds of people, naturally, but uh, especially true of us. Uh, and in the Irish experience, the past is anchored by the tragedies, the decades long tragedies of the great hunger, the 19th century famine that sent millions of people away from Ireland and many of them to the United States. One of the people who uh, came to the United States out of the tragedy of the hunger was my mother's father. Um, and his story is a kind of tragic one. He was a man who lost his balance to alcohol, left his family. The dominant experience my mother had was being a 14-year-old girl uh, suddenly in a position of having to help support her uh, six uh, brothers and sisters. And um, that really defined her life. And of course, it stamped me. And all of the triumphs of that story, my mother did really well. Uh, she never went back to school, never finished eighth grade, but she was a strong woman who raised five sons, all of whom uh, revered her memory, uh, lived good, have lived good lives. My brothers and I are very close. I dedicate this book to my brother Joe, who died last year just as I was finishing it. My dad, also from the south side of Chicago, worked as a, a pipe fitter's helper in the stockyards, I went to night school for seven years, finally got a law degree. No law firms in Chicago were hiring Irish Catholics out of Loyola. He went into the FBI, which began a distinguished career in the United States government, which prompted the move to Washington where I was raised. But through all of that, and then even through the tumultuous years of my own upbringing, which were the civil rights movement, then the anti-war movement, the raucous 60s, a time of great disillusionment for the Catholic Church, the time of transformation with the Second Vatican Council. Through all of that, my Irish identity uh, was a kind of center, and it remains so. I'm a citizen of Ireland. Um, I love Ireland. I get there as much as I can. But, and in Ireland, I'm always aware of the privilege I have of being an Irish American. So loving uh, my country, my ethnic background, and my faith define who I am, Tom. And the interesting thing, given all of that, is, uh, you know, obviously, the truth at the heart of the lie, the new book, a lot of what you've written about is critical, but you're also upfront about how important, in a positive sense, the church was to people, especially like your mother. Can you talk a little bit more before we get into the criticisms? Of course. What, what, were, well, what, were, what were some of the, how was this an important foundation well, the, for the her Irish, and for you? The Irish were famous, of course, for their devotion to the Catholic faith. And with good reason. When you look up close at what the Irish experienced back through the centuries was, the brutal, brutal oppression of uh, 
the dominant English colonizers, a religious war that over the centuries killed hundreds of thousands of Irish Catholics and drove Irish Catholics into a, uh, a deep hole of second class citizenship in their own country. And what was the key to their resistance and you could say to their survival? It, it was, I would say, their faith and the strength uh, the Irish drew from the Catholic Church, from the memory of Jesus Christ, from the men and women who carried him forward, the priests, the sisters, the parents, the families, the extended families, the towns, all of that, uh, a beautiful tapestry centered on the church. Uh, and that's deep in the DNA of people like me. I'm sure it's true of many of the people listening to us and reading us now. And that's, of course, the precondition of the shock of this book. Because that faith defining Ireland and the Irish is in a state of collapse now. Uh, and everyone uh, with us today knows what I'm talking about. And the symbol of that is the difference between the visit to Ireland of Pope John Paul II in 1979, when more people showed up to cheer him than actually lived in that island nation. You know, millions of people showed up to cheer Pope John Paul II. The Irish Catholic faith was on full display and it was at its peak. Well, a couple of summers ago, Pope Francis, our dear Pope Francis, whom we were so glad to see elevated to the papacy and who brought the whole world uh, back to a positive view of the Catholic Church, that when he went to Ireland in the summer of 2018, Ireland was by then ground zero of the pre-sex abuse scandal. People will remember the Ryan Report, Judge Ryan presiding over a decade-long examination of Irish schools, orphanages, and work work homes, uh, refuges, places mostly uh, run by the Catholic Church. And what the Ryan Report showed was that thousands of Irish children had been brutally abused in those places. Some of them reduced to what the report called a kind of slavery, a kind of sex slavery at that. The abuse of Irish children by Catholic priests is as bad, if not worse, than in any other place. Um, the reliable number, of, the number reliably put of victims of priests in Ireland is approaching 20,000. It's more than 18,000. And surely that's a major undercount. And in a population as small as Ireland, that suggests that almost everybody in Ireland is somehow related to a victim of a priest. So should we have been surprised that less than half as many people turned out to welcome Pope Francis in 2018 as had welcomed Pope John Paul II. The Irish people had swatted away the orders of the Catholic hierarchy and electing a gay man as prime minister in approving uh, legislation that the church disapproved of. The number of priests turning out each year in Ireland suddenly shrank to almost nothing, where before they were counted in the dozens, now they're counted on one hand or two at most. And that's the occasion for this book, Tom, because when I saw Pope Francis's detached and aloof response to the heartbroken people of Ireland, something snapped in me. I described that snap. It really happened when the issue of the so-called Magdalene laundries came up. Your listeners will know that the Magdalene laundries refers to homes for unled mothers, uh, mostly run by Catholic sisters, that down through the decades had theoretically provided a place of refuge for women who were uh, in the 
difficult situation of being unwed mothers. But then it turned out, and this came to the fore in recent years too, that in these places, those women were brutally abused and their children too were brutally abused. And you know from all of us Irish know that in recent years, commissions have found that children were neglected to the point of death. Hundreds of children buried in unmarked graves, some of them in sewage pits. The Magdalene Laundries, one of the great Catholic heartbreaks that I'm aware of. And it was a heartbreak for the Irish people. When Pope Francis was asked about it, he responded that he had never heard of it. He had never heard of what he called the laundromat of women. And when I read that, Tom, I'm not proud of this. My first thought was, Pope Francis is lying. This scandal had been so covered across the world. Documentary films had been made about it. A feature film starring Judy Dench called Philomena had been made about it. It was well known on both sides of the Atlantic. Pope Francis had never heard of it? The laundromat of women? And then I checked myself. Maybe the Pope is telling the truth. I shouldn't judge that. But wouldn't it be almost as bad if he had never heard of it? And, How can the Pope not have heard of it? And the irony being that that for some people, I mean, this is something else you you, you wrestle with in, in the new book. For some people, there's a feeling like, hey, Francis is the start of a new moment, a new era, breath of fresh air. Uh, and, and the change has begun. And it uh, that's not quite, you're not quite as optimistic as that, are you? Well, that's what I thought. Listen, I've been celebrating Pope Francis since he became Pope eight years ago. I wrote a cover story for a major magazine saluting him. Uh, I've written again and again and again about his triumphs of witness for climate change, for migrants, against fascism, against uh, ethnic po populism, the great defender of democracy in Europe. I mean, this man has been a, a, a great gift to the modern moment. And no wonder people from around the world have looked to him. And there's the revelation, Tom. If even Pope Francis doesn't get it about how much trouble the church is in because of clericalism, because of this abusive power structure with the priest at the center, with sexual neurosis driving the morality of the church. If Pope Francis doesn't see the need for drastic reform, then that shows you what a deep problem we have because he's as good as they come. He is as good as they come and he doesn't see it either. He's a, a prisoner of his own experience as a priest a prisoner of clericalism. Clericalism is a structure of power like a pyramid with the Pope on top, the bishops al along the sides, the priests near the bottom and the lay people underneath. That structure of power is what the bishops protect when they protect a predator. It isn't that they don't care that a child has been abused. It's that they have to protect everyone who's on that structure of power with them. Otherwise, they'll all lose their place. They'll all have to move out of a medieval monarchy into, yes, a kind of new democracy because the opposite of that patriarchy isn't matriarchy, it's democracy. And the church has been struggling to come to terms with democracy for as long as I've been alive. And that's actually the bottom line issue here. Yeah, I mean, you, you essentially, for all the problems you just outlined, you, you, you essentially, the center of your argument is the priesthood, right? You've, you've, you've called for the abolition, essentially, of the priesthood. Why, why do you see that as sort of the middle of all this? Well, the priest, let me just first say, I, like so many Catholics, have depended my whole life long on good priests, especially for the celebration of the Mass, which centered my life. But the priesthood itself has become the problem. The priesthood is part of that structure of power that protects itself against everything else. And if the priesthood wasn't the issue, 
then over the last 20 years, going back to the Ryan Report, going back to the Boston Globe spotlight story that became that hit movie, if the priesthood wasn't the issue, then Catholic priests themselves would have been demanding a reform of this structure of power. But the priests, even the good ones, have been quiet and subservient to this structure of power. It's one thing for the bishops not to challenge it, but where are the priests? The priesthood itself, Tom, has been corrupted. And suddenly you see it in a new light because one of the things about the priesthood is, obviously it's all male. Women are not welcome to the priesthood. What is that telling us? Let's look at that again. The Catholic priesthood is a male supremacist institution. We live in the era of Me Too, the era of women saying enough to second class citizenship, enough to being abused by male power. That's true in the Catholic Church too. And priests, all Catholics, Catholic lay people, we should all be calling time out, time's up on the denigration of women, the forced subjugation of women, embodied above all in the refusal to admit women to the priesthood, the center of Catholic life. Now, I know you've heard this, but there's the inevitable other way to look at this and say, look, this is, like it or not, this is the church. You know, why don't you leave? Why don't you find another, why don't you find another religion that's more fitting to your beliefs? This is what the church is. Why do you think it's important to reform the Catholic Church? Well, I, I have the impulse to reform the church because the Catholic Church gave it to me. I was a young seminarian and priest in the time of the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 1965, called by the great Pope John XXIII, who invited Catholics to think of the church in a new way. And uh, it's a long time ago, and many people, younger people like yourself, didn't have direct experience of the old church. The old church was never going to change. In fact, one of the things that it was said about it is it's changeless. And the symbol of this changelessness was the Latin mass. Mass was never said in any language except Latin. In the Catholic imagination, we pictured Jesus saying mass in Latin. Two things, A, Jesus didn't speak Latin, and B, he didn't say mass, you know. Uh, the priesthood as we know it came, came about years, decades, centuries later. The church uh, had to change during the Second Vatican Council because its basic problem had been laid bare by the Holocaust, which was, at the heart of Catholic life was an anti-Judaism, an anti-Jewishness, a, a, a willingness to scapegoat the Jewish people for the murder of Christ, the Christ killers, a charge that we find in the gospels, let his blood be upon us and upon our children, the Jewish crowd says in Holy Week, this is Holy Week, and Catholics are remembering this again, the church, saw where that Christ killer charge and the anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism attached to it led. It led to the Holocaust, which is why the church in one of the great uh, noble turnarounds in history in the Second Vatican Council renounced that Christ killer charge and rejected Christian and, Jew uh, Christian and Catholic anti-Semitism. The biggest change in the history of the Christian faith. And the changes I'm calling for now, Tom, are, are actually peanuts compared to that. I have seen the change. I've seen the church change and change quickly because of the leadership of a pope and bishops who had seen through the tragedy of something very wrong, the need for change. Well, we have a new tragedy staring us in the face now. The abuse, let's call it what it is, the rape of many children by men wearing woman collars. And that requires us to look deeply and see what must be changed. And that's what I'm 
calling for in this book. Yeah, and you make a really important point also that, you know, for all the negatives that we have to talk about, I, I've always said that, you know, w once we, we talk sufficiently about the true victims, the children and, 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 and the victims of sexual abuse and all that, the other victims of, of the ongoing problems with the church are those who go about doing their work, the priests, the nuns and all that, who go about doing their work every day and, and help the needy and all that. Those are also yes, victims course. too, because their work gets sort of cast aside. Of course, and we should think of those people, especially the women among them. Women have been the backbone of the, of the missions of the church and still are. You know, all over the planet, there are hundreds of thousands, no, millions of Catholic men and women doing the work of the Lord, what we used to call the corporal works of mercy, educating the ignorant, healing the sick, bringing uh, sustenance, food, into the uh, lives of people who are hungry. Uh, the, the Catholic Church is the largest NGO in the world. It is a magnificent uh, mission of goodness, mercy. Pope Francis's watchword is mercy. And those are the Catholics I'm most paying attention to. And many of them are priests and sisters who have been the heroes of this uh, terribly difficult time. I'm calling on them too to demand change. And if they demanded it, it would come. How many Catholic professionals are there? By that I mean people who work for the church, not just clergy and sisters, the doctors, the teachers, the social workers, the people bringing uh, food into villages that need it. There are hundreds of thousands, millions of them. They're the ones who should be leading the charge against clericalism, against this uh, misogynist, uh, and sadistic structure of power that is ruining the church as we've seen it ruin the church in Ireland. Um, as we wrap this up, a couple of uh, more questions, a couple of final questions. Uh, first, we have a, a relatively new president in America, President Biden. He has worn uh, his Catholicism on his sleeve to some degree, as well as his Irishness. Uh, do you see the new president as any uh, in some way, a symbol of reform, a breath of fresh air. What role do you see the president in play playing in the public debate around religion and Catholicism? As an Irish Catholic American, I am so proud of Joe Biden. He is the epitome of what's good about our tradition. And I'm so grateful to him for wearing his Catholic faith on his sleeve. And he understands it. What do we see in him? We see a compassionate, empathetic man to whom mercy is a key value and who understands that the church's role is especially there for helping the grieving. We're a nation, a world in grief right now because of this virus. And the first thing that Joe Biden did as president, you remember, the eve of his inauguration, he presided over what was a wake in effect at the Lincoln Memorial, lifting up the hundreds of thousands of Americans who had died and then did not have a proper send off, no funerals, no gatherings of loved ones, a crushing deprivation. And then the next day at his inaugural address, he gave a kind of eulogy for them. And where did he go immediately after the inauguration? Not to a party, he went to Arlington Cemetery where he laid a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown and prayed for all of those who had died in this virus. Joe Biden shows us what Catholic faith is about. And he also shows us what Vatican II Catholic faith is about because he's a man of conscience and he's faithful to his conscience even if it puts him in violation with the hierarchy, which is why he is a pro-choice politician for which some Catholic bishops wanna uh, forbid him from receiving communion. And I'll just note that a couple of weeks ago, the Vatican issued a very cruel, nasty condemnation of gay marriage, forbidding Catholic priests from blessing it in any way. It made me remember a time when Joe Biden was vice president. 
and he actually overstepped his authority. He, he crossed the line. He said, while President Obama was still negative about it, he said that gay marriage is the right thing to do. And just like that, he shut down the ambivalence of the White House. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was one of those unfortunate moments when someone tells the truth, right? He told the truth. <laughs> I would like Joe Biden to do that again for the Catholic Church. I wish, I have this image of him saying very respectfully, dear Pope Francis, your watchword of mercy needs to extend to gay folks too, as it seemed to in the beginning of your papacy. Gay marriage can be blessed. When God looks at gay people, he sees his own beloved creation. And that uh, blessing needs to be articulated in the faith. So Joe Biden is uh, a great Irish American Catholic. And those of us who are Irish American Catholics are right to be very proud of him. And uh, that's a good lead, lead into a final question. Uh, aside from all the criticisms and, 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 and sort of points for reform that you outline, another sort of thing we're all struggling against is a sort of broader secularism, right? Like, I mean, what role does religion in general have in the 21st century? And, you know, the way things are moving, uh, what do you think we lose as a culture? It could be that, you know, we read your, someone could read your book and say, you know what, this institution is so corrupt and that institution is so corrupt. Let's just forget about religion in general. Uh, there is that sentiment out there. What do you say to that? Uh, what do we lose if we sort of just wash our hands, so to speak? Well, well thank that? you for making that point and asking about that. That's why I am still a Catholic. Exactly why. Uh, I welcome the secular moment. I welcome the invitation to, to value science and rationality above superstition and even above uh, mindless tradition. I welcome it. The secular impulse makes us religious people think harder about what we believe. And it helps us understand that we need to be much more modest about the claims we make. For example, about God. We speak about God as if God is, well, someone up in heaven who's a person who uh you know is 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 just another another thing another reality but god is beyond that the word god points to something for which we have no language the most important experiences we humans have are experiences that are beyond our language. When we really are in love, we, we try to express it, but our words fall short. When we're really in pain, we try to express it, but our words fall short. And when we hope for life beyond death, we can feel it, but we can't express it. Religion is a language for that that is beyond language. And if we lose that, we've lost something very precious to human life, which is why human beings, to be fully human, do need religion. Tom, we live in a time when so many religions, my own included, ours, have in a way forced people to quit, they have forced people to walk away by the bad behavior, the dishonesty, the willful ignorance. A reformed religious imagination is crucial for the human future. And it's crucial for all of us uh, confronted at the moment of death. But it's also crucial for us as a species if we're going to find a way to surpass ourselves and survive this period when we're threatened with what you could call species suicide whether through weapons of mass destruction, the bomb, or through climate degradation. So I say religion is urgently important, but it needs to be reformed, rational, pluralistic, respectful of others who don't see it the way we do. 
lifting up the equality of women and lifting up the dignity of every life everywhere on the planet. And at its best, that is exactly what the Catholic Church can be. And on that note, uh, we are out of time. We've been talking to James Carroll, a uh, National Book Award winning author. He is talking, he's the author of, I, I, I believe, as many as two dozen books, fiction and nonfiction. We've been talking about his new book, The Truth at the Heart of the Lie, How the Catholic Chur Church Lost Its Soul. And he just told us why we believe that soul should be saved. Uh, I'm Tom Degnan for Irish America. James, thanks so much for joining us. Tom, thanks to you and to all of the folks of Irish America. Stay well. I wish you well. Bye.